probably everyone here has at least heard a reference to the Searle effect. Um, it's, it's turned into really a soap opera in alternative science. And you know, John Searle has been doing his research since the 40s. But the Searle effect is an excellent case study in terms of the mythology and the reality of alternative science. And in his case, one of the things that makes it so excellent is the length of time. It fades out of our current reality into the myths of history. So it's like, how much of this is really real? How much of it are stories that have been repeated so many times they're not even close to what really happened? How much of it has been made up and then interjected into this mythos for Searle? Right? We see the same thing with UFOs. Over the last few years, we've started to see some of the same things for some of the superconductor research. T.T. Uh, Brown is obviously a comparable example. The biggest departure, I think, for B. Phil Brown from the reality that we know and observe, or at least you know, the historical reality that we know, was um, the B-2 bomber, right? That was something that Paul LaValette came up with. I believe he was the first person. A lot of people have heard that the B-2 may have anti-gravity on it. Um, I came to a little bit different conclusion personally. Now, I don't know for sure. I've never been on one. Actually, I've never seen one in flight. But, um, but the, the idea was that they were using the B. Phil Brown effect to create an anti-gravity effect. Um, whatever the reality of that myth is, at the very least, it started out being speculative and just became more speculative from there. So what we've tried to do is address some of these, these mythological aspects of gravity research to try and cross-correlate things and say, if person A sees a side effect, right, like the Searle effect generator runs cold. Now, Searle, when he came up with this idea, this is the 1940s, 1950s, he apparently just said, well, it looks like this thing gets ice cold when it runs. In fact, in his case, he said it became superconducting because it became so cold, which indicates, you know, several hundred degrees below zero. Well, if Searle just pops up and says it becomes cold when it runs, we can't tell one way or the other. We don't know what to think of that. But we do know if we see somebody over here, for instance, Marcus, Marcus Hollingshead from the Marcus device controversy, Marcus popped up in 2000, I believe this was late 2002. Marcus had never heard of Searle, had absolutely no reference to Searle whatsoever, never even heard the name of it. He was an Indian inventor who wasn't even looking for gravity. What he was looking for was a way to model the magnetic fields of the Earth for some arcane reason. And one of the things he'd indicated was it ran cold. So now we have two separate cases. Those aren't the only two, obviously. We, we start to piece these things together, and we have a class of device. And the interesting thing that we found is the more we cross-correlate data, and again, incredibly diverse sources, these people know nothing about each other. They know nothing about each other's work. They're separated sometimes by decades. And yet we're finding they're all converging in on a core set of ideas. Um, you know, in the case of the, the SEG, not only did it run cold, it used the hallmark of, of what we think of as, it, I guess, the, well, I like to call it true anti-gravity. Uh, Beefield Brown has been argued to death. In fact, we, we got tired of arguing it. <laughs> um, true anti-gravity would be, you know, in, in, the world's of Sur, in the words of Searle, it doesn't just take off from the workbench, it takes the bench with it. Um, the Searle effect generator, you know, obviously one of the examples that he has cited, again, no verifiable evidence for it, was that it took the bench with it when he uh, connected it to the bench and powered it up under a full load. Uh, Marcus claimed the same thing. There are numerous claims of effects like this. What we're seeing are these nonlinear effects, and they come out of essentially rotating magnetic field devices. It's hard to be more specific than that because there are, again, there are hundreds of variations. Um, what we're finding is, even in devices that seem diverse enough that they don't even match, like the superconductor devices, you wouldn't think superconductors would have anything to do with mercury plasmas, which tie into the Nazi bell, or anything to do with the Searle effect generator. And when you get down to the electrical and the field-based level of these things, you start to see the relationships here actually become uncanny. They're so striking that it's amazing. And again, you have side effects described by a diverse source of people, you know, people who've never met each other, that match up so well, it's as if they're describing the same phenomena coming from different devices. Now, there are tons and tons of theories that explain why this might happen. One of my personal favorites, my pet theory for the last year, has been Einstein's unified field theory. One of the things that I liked about this theory was nonlinearity of effects. The effects form an exponential curve when you're working at smaller energy levels, right, like all modern electronics, pretty much, pretty much anything made in the last 20 years, right, your cell phone, your radio, anything like that, 
you're working so far down on this curve, you don't see any effects. These unified field theory effects, because it's an explanation for everything, they're always there, they're always present. But you just don't see them, you can't measure them. They, for all intents and purposes, don't exist. So you start to work your way up this curve, and you might see some strange side effects. Um, there was a company that I had done a story on. I can't really disclose it at the conference, unfortunately. They had done some testing that blew out their power supplies. It created unshieldable EM effects. That's a classic unified field theory effect. It's actually a back EMF that comes out of your gravitational field. You're creating ripples in time space, and they hadn't thought to look for it at the time, but those ripples create conventional induction in circuits. And since it's going through, any kind of shielding you might have blows out the power supply. So as you work your way up the scale from there, you start to get what looks like the onset of maybe Philadelphia experiment effects. Again, it's, it's a strange story, but the more research I did into this, uh, the more truth I found behind certain portions of it. I, should, I guess I could phrase it like that. My focus was on the tech, not on the story, not on Montauk or anything like that. Um, you work your way even further up, you begin to see full-scale gravity shielding. Um, it looks like Large scale, again, true anti-gravity, um, there's not a linear relationship between input power and output thrust. The nice thing about this, what this tells us is, we can use electrical systems that don't require enormous amounts of output to lift incredible amounts of weight. And the reason is that because we're not actually lifting the weight. What it turns into, actually I think the story is up there, it becomes a gravitational transistor. I think that's what these things are all telling us. They're telling us this energy is out there, maybe it's free energy, maybe it's in the background of time and space, maybe it's not free at all, maybe it's just something that's naturally occurring that we just kind of sort of can tap into, don't understand why it's happening. Um, maybe we're tapping into something completely new, but whatever the case may be, by modifying time space with a small amount of energy, time space itself does the work to lift these devices out.